The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn is a novel by Mark Twain, a pseudonym for Samuel Clemens. It was published in 1884. Before starting, get your notepads ready as this is a long video. Today we will discuss in detail the historical background, summary, themes, and symbolism of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Written in the past tense, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn is a picaresque children's fiction with elements of romance, satire, and Bildungsroman. The novel is set approximately 1835 to 1845 before the Civil War around the Mississippi River town of St. Petersburg, Missouri, Arkansas, in the American South. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn is from the person-person limited perspective of the protagonist, Huckleberry Finn, who embarks on adventures with Tom Sawyer and Jim. As the narrator, Huck Finn is a 13- or 14-year-old boy, the tone of the novel is boyish, excited, times reflective and mostly mocking or ironic, which is Mark Twain's wit. Before we start with the summary of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, it is important to learn about the historical context of the novel to identify the themes and key ideas. Mark Twain, a steadfast advocate for abolition and emancipation, criticized the racial segregation and repression of slavery in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn which is a sequel to his earlier successful adventure novel, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, which was first published in 1876. Twain wrote this book during the Reconstruction Era, a period following the conclusion of the Civil War in 1865 and the subsequent abolition of slavery in the United States. Despite the legal rejection of slavery, the white majority persisted in the systematic oppression of the black minority, notable in the establishment of the Jim Crow laws in 1876. Enforcing Racial Segregation The states began formulating their own regulations regarding slavery, leading to the division of the country into free states in the northern region and slave states in the southern part. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 was a negotiated agreement between anti-slavery representatives from the north and pro-slavery representatives from the south. This arrangement permitted Missouri's entry into the Union as a slave state, but it prohibited slavery in all other territories situated north of Missouri's southern border. Missouri, being a relatively new area for white settlement, did not fully embrace the slave-reliant social and economic structure of the Deep South. This unique circumstance allowed runaway slaves from the South to utilize the Mississippi River as an escape route towards the North, where they would attain freedom, which The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn depicts. The novel begins with two separate statements indicative of Mark Twain's wit and research for the novel. The first is the notice from G.G., the chief of ordnance, who warns against finding any motive, plot and moral in the novel and such persons would be prosecuted, banished and shot. Thus, the notice is a glimpse of the light-hearted, witty and gusty comedy to follow within the novel. The second statement is the explanatory which declares that extensive research was made to inculcate the different characters' regional dialects such as the Missouri Black dialect, the Backwoods Southwestern dialect, and the Ordinary Pike County dialect. Mark Twain assures the readers that these dialects were researched painstakingly and with the trustworthy guidance. The author states, I make this explanation for the reason that without it many readers would suppose that all these characters were trying to talk alike and not succeeding. The explanatory not only dares to reader to contest him on the knowledge of the South but also validates the notion that the novel is rooted in anti-romanticism and social realism. Huckleberry Finn introduces himself as a character originating from the prequel to his own story, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. That book was made by Mr. Mark Twain, and he told the truth, mainly, in which Tom and me found the money that the robbers hid in the cave, and it made us rich. We got six thousand dollars apiece, all gold. Judge Thatcher he took it and put it out at interest and the bank detained the money in trust for them. However, he now resides with the widow Douglas and her sanctimonious sister, Miss Watson. Despite resenting the civilized life insisted by the widow, Huck complies to attend church and school, adopt cleanliness and be respectable to maintain his spot in Tom's robber's gang. One night, Huck's abusive drunkard father, Pap, resurfaces, demanding Huck's fortune and berating him, you've put on considerable many frills since I've been away. I'll take you down a peg before I get done with you. Legal efforts by the widow and Judge Thatcher to gain custody fail as the new judge refuses to interfere in separate families, leading to an enraged Pap who harasses Huck for several months for money. Meanwhile, Huck had started to enjoy his stay with the widow and Miss Watson and learned to read as I didn't want to go to school much, before, but I reckoned I'd go now despite Pap. 
After an argument with Widow Douglas, the infuriated Pap kidnaps Huck and takes him to a remote log old cabin near the Illinois shore. Enduring Pap's drunken rages and beatings, the imprisoned Huck decides to escape by faking his death as if someone murdered him. He can use stock with food and supplies, on Jackson's Island in the Mississippi River's middle, encountering Jim, a runaway slave of Miss Watson. Jim had run away after overhearing Miss Watson's intention to separate him from his wife and children and to sell him to a cruel slave trader in New Orleans. Together, they live on the island, fishing and exploring the floating house in which there is a dead body that Jim didn't let Huck see. Until Huck learns from the nearby town of a slave hunter's after Jim, suspect of Huck's murder, for a reward of $300. This prompts them to embark on a raft journey to the free states where slavery is banned. After several days, caught in a fog, they miss their route and, faced with the moral dilemma of turning Jim to the encountered slave hunters, Huck ultimately decides to protect Jim's quest for freedom. On the way, they escape with the loot of a gang of robbers. However, their raft is struck by a steamboat, separating Huck and Jim. Huck finds himself in front of the residence of the southern aristocratic Grangerford family, who extend their hospitality to him. However, the Grangerfords are embroiled in a senseless and destructive feud with the Shepherdsons. The conflict reaches a tragic peak when Sophia Grangerford runs away with Harney Shepherdson, leading to a violent escalation of gunfight. Barely escaping the bloodshed, Huck reunites with Jim who was hiding nearby and resumes their river journey on the repaired raft. Along the way down river a few days later, they encounter two con men escaping armed pursuers. Offering them refuge, Huck and Jim unwillingly host self-proclaimed the Duke and the King. One feigns to be the Duke of Bridgewater while the other pretends to be the heir to the French throne, the Dauphin. The con artists exploit their hospitality and take control of the raft while engaging in scams in the visiting towns. Learning of a man named Peter Wilkes' death, the duo poses as his brothers to claim his inheritance. Despite winning over most of the townspeople and selling Wilkes' estate, suspicions arise about their authenticity. Feeling sympathy for Peter's nieces, Huck devises a plan to expose the fraud. As the real brothers arrive, the Duke and King are unmasked but manage to escape to the raft with Huck and Jim. The con men sell Jim to Silas Phelps, a local farmer, claiming a reward for his alleged escape. Instead of doing the right thing and the clean thing by informing Miss Watson of Jim's location, the distraught, Huck decides to rescue Jim, even if it means facing dire consequences for his wickedness. As Huck observes the Phelps farm, where Jim is held captive, he catches the attention of one of the family's slaves, who mistakes him for a visiting nephew. Seizing the opportunity, Huck goes along with the misunderstanding and soon realizes that the nephew he is pretending to be is Tom Sawyer. Welcomed as Tom by Aunt Sally and Uncle Silas, Huck stops the real Tom before he reaches the farm and briefs him on the situation. Excited about the potential adventure, Tom not only impersonates to be his half-brother, Sid Sawyer but also commits to helping Huck free Jim. Collaborating on escape plans, Huck suggests a straightforward approach. Still, Tom, reminiscent of classic adventure novels, prefers elaborate impractical schemes because what's the good of a plan that ain't no more trouble than that? It's as mild as goose milk. For instance, rather than lifting Jim's chain by raising the bed leg, Tom insists on sawing through it. When Huck dismisses sawing through Jim's leg, Tom proposes tunneling instead of using the cabin door for escape and drafts a warning letter to Uncle Silas about looming misfortune. Although Aunt Sally notices missing items, she remains oblivious to the grand escapade Tom and Huck are orchestrating. On the night of the escape, Uncle Silas brings extra men to guard Jim's cabin, but Jim, Tom, and Huck slip through the tunnel and make their way towards the woods. Their departure doesn't go unnoticed, and some men open fire, resulting in Tom getting shot in the calf and needing immediate medical attention. Jim stays with the injured Tom while Huck goes to fetch a doctor. Unfortunately, Huck gets delayed at the Phelpses before the doctor returns. Finally, the doctor, Tom, who is still unwell from the gunshot, and Jim all arrive at the farm. The doctor vouches for Jim's character, revealing that he aided in treating Tom's wound despite knowing that staying would jeopardize his freedom. As Tom recuperates, he discloses to Aunt Sally their elaborate plan of freeing Jim, unaware that Jim has been recaptured. Tom, wanted the adventure of it, explains that Miss Watson, Jim's former owner, had passed away two months prior and had freed Jim in her will. Aunt Polly's unexpected appearance at the Phelps farm reveals the true identities of Sid and Tom and confirms Jim's freedom. 
In a surprising turn, Huck learns that Judge Thatcher is still holding his money, totaling $6,000 and more. Also, Jim reveals that the dead man they encountered weeks ago in the floating house was, in fact, Huck's father. Tom suggests that Huck, Jim and him embark on new adventures by heading to the Indian territories. The adventures of Huckleberry Finn ends with Huck's decision. But I reckon I got to light out for the territory ahead of the rest, because Aunt Sally she's going to adopt me and civilize me, and I can't stand it. I been there before. Now let's analyze the adventures of Huckleberry Finn for its most important themes and key ideas. Slavery is a glaring theme in the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, set before the Civil War when slavery was legal and served as the economic backbone of the American South. The story takes place in Missouri during the 1830s or 1840s, a period when Missouri was recognized as a slave state. Mark Twain, both in his personal and public life, strongly opposed slavery. The adventures of Huckleberry Finn, therefore, functions as an allegory of the unethicalness of slavery. Several characters, such as Miss Watson, the Grangerford clan, and the Phelps family, are depicted as white slaveholders, while others, like the Duke and the King, indirectly benefit from slavery by selling Jim and scrupulously. While slaveholders benefit, the slaves endure oppression, exploitation, and both physical and mental abuse. The novel is seemingly about Huck's adventures, but it pivots around Jim's pursuit of freedom and safety for himself and his family, astonishing Huck as it most froze me to hear such talk. Huck details that Jim plans to he was saying how the first thing he would do when he got to a free state he would go to saving up money and never spend a single cent. And when he got enough he would buy his wife, which was owned on a farm close to where Miss Watson lived. And then they would both work to buy the two children, and if their master wouldn't sell them, they'd get an ablitionist to go and steal them. Twain, through Huck's boyish excited perspective, addresses the issue of slavery. Throughout their journey down the river, Jim cares for Huck not as a servant but as a friend, prompting readers to feel sympathy for Jim and contempt for the society that enslaves and endangers him. When Huck initially discovers Jim, he vows to keep Jim's secret since people would call me a low-down abolitionist and despise me for keeping mom, but that don't make no difference. I ain't a going to tell. Although Twain critiques slavery through Jim's portrayal, he avoids direct discussion on the matter. The narrative is from the perspective of a young white man born and bred amid slavery, Huck struggles with internal conflict. Huck's dilemma is freeing Jim, which conflicts with his upbringing's teachings leaving him torn between perceived wickedness and moral duty but ultimately Huck rejects the societal norms in his attempts to free Jim. As the novel involves white slaveholders and black slaves, the theme of slavery is tightly looped with the theme of racism and prejudice. Despite Mark Twain writing The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn two decades after the Emancipation Proclamation and the end of the Civil War, America dealt with persistent racism and the lingering effects of slavery. By the early 1880s, the Reconstruction efforts to incorporate freed slaves into society were faltering. The South's new form of racism was less institutionalized and colossal as African Americans faced unfair treatment under Jim Crow laws. During this time, black lives were devalued and considered possessions. They were treated as commodities, with limited acknowledgement of their rights and personhood. Jim is cruelly separated from his wife and children. White slaveholders justified the subjugation, exploitation, and violence by clinging to racist typecasts that portrayed black people as intellectually inferior. Despite Pap being a violent man, Jim, an honest individual, faced suspicion for Huck's supposed murder merely because he was black and a runaway slave. When Jim is returned after escaping the Phelpses, the neighbors, fueled by anger, contemplate lynching him to set an example for their slaves. Ultimately, they spared Jim's life solely to avoid his owner would turn up and make us pay for him, sure. Huck initially subscribed to racial stereotypes. Acknowledging his societal and legal obligation to report Jim's escape, but his perception changes through his time spent with Jim and recognizing Jim's honesty. By the novel's end, Huck is willing to rebel against society and religion, rather than allowing Jim to be returned to slavery. Jim consistently displays more practical wisdom than the white characters, yet their prejudices prevent them from recognizing it. An instance of this is when Huck, using flawed logic, attempts to explain why it's natural for French people to speak a different language. Jim cleverly flips Huck's reasoning on its head, demonstrating that it makes no sense for French people to speak another language. 
Unfortunately, Huck fails to acknowledge Jim's clever retort, saying I see it warrant no use wasting words, you can't learn a black person to argue. Also, Tom contemplates sawing through Jim's leg for their planned escape, not out of necessity, but because he has read about such adventures. Ultimately Tom decides, there ain't necessity enough in this case, and besides, Jim's a black person so he wouldn't understand the reasons for it, and how it's the custom in Europe. So we'll let it go. When Tom is shot during the escape attempt, Jim decides to stay with him until a doctor arrives, sacrificing his freedom. Huck, recognizing Jim's exceptional kindness, declares that Jim is white inside, insinuating that only a white person could exhibit such compassion for others. While any white person assisting in saving Tom's life would be celebrated as a hero, the doctor's compliment is limited to Jim's ain't no bad black person. Before we end the video, we will discuss the symbolic meanings of the two most significant symbols of the The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. The Mississippi River is symbolic of freedom for Huck and Jim. Acting as a conduit, the river propels them toward liberation, Jim toward the free states and Huck away from his abusive father and the stifling civilizing of Miss Watson and St. Petersburg. Similar to the river's nature, both Huck and Jim remain in a state of unrest, open to amending their perspectives on each other. The river, like them, is malleable and progressive, exemplified in its compassion and adaptability to shifting situations. Yet, the river's freedom comes with unpredictability and threats. River floods expose them to criminals and raft breakage, while a frightening fog leads them past Cairo, disrupting their plan to head to the Ohio River and the Free States. Once tackled by the Duke and Dauphin, the river ceases to offer freedom to Huck and Jim but becomes a platform for the scheming duo. Despite providing an escape from trouble, the river often trades one adversity for another. The novel's progression shifts the river's initial benevolent perception to a source of peril. As the characters drift southward, mirroring the South's cemented slavery, the river transitions from escape to danger. Ending with Huck and Jim finding freedom on dry land, an ironic twist on the earlier symbolic sanctuary of the river. The raft as the means of transportation for Huck and Jim down the Mississippi River is a symbol of liberation from societal constraints. It represents a space where Huck and Jim, the Duke and the King who join them, can peacefully coexist, honor differences and offer mutual support. On the raft, Huck and Jim enjoy the freedom to act according to their own judgment, transcending the roles of runaway and fugitive slave. Huck's happiest moments occur while on the raft with Jim, we said there weren't no home like a raft, after all. Other places do seem so cramped up and smothery, but a raft don't. You feel mighty free and easy and comfortable on a raft. While on the raft, Huck's callous pranks and the dilemma about whether to betray Jim coincide with frightening fog and the raft splitting. After Huck witnesses the violent Grangerford Shepherdson clash, Jim reappears in his life with the repaired raft, symbolizing the forming, fracturing, and mending of trust between them. Through their Mississippi River journey, the raft becomes a symbol of a space outside societal norms, allowing them to transcend the social restrictions and racial barriers of that repressive time. The raft becomes a familial space, with Jim taking on a substitute fatherly role, a dynamic not accepted in civilized society. This was for today. Hope you liked the video. Do share and subscribe for more such videos.